Will intermittent fasting increase your likelihood of dying from a heart attack? You may have heard this headline, and certainly it got my attention. So I wanted to take a moment to unpack this recent study and help inform if this is true, if it should inform behavior, and also share with you, as we fact-checked this study, one thing that I learned and how I will be changing the way I fast going forward. Just to define it, there are various protocols of intermittent fasting. Said simply, you're going to try to consolidate your eating window and then also have an intentional fasting window. The most common type and what this paper looked at was what's known as TRE or time-restricted feeding. And this study, the, the headline, I really shouldn't say study because it was a poster presentation at the American Heart Association. So picture a conference, and in the lobby, there's a number of exhibitors and uh, people sharing data. Literally, in many cases, their results are printed out on a poster. And so this is an attempt to share preliminary findings. But one of the weaknesses is that poster data has not gone through peer review. So it hasn't been subject to other scientists scrutinizing and looking for weaknesses in the methodology, the controlling, bias, et cetera. So it is important to mention that. Now, it doesn't mean that poster data is automatically disqualified and that we shouldn't pay attention to it. This group of researchers had the hypothesis that TRE, or time-restricted feeding, would actually improve cardiovascular and, and uh, all-cause mortality outcomes. They found the opposite. They found that eating over a period of less than eight hours led to a 91% increased risk of cardiovascular mortality, and there was no benefit for what's known as all-cause mortality or death from any cause, nor was there any benefit for cancer mortality. If this has been helpful, please subscribe, comment, and share this video with one person you think it might help. Okay, so a few of the details. This was survey data. It was a large sample size, over 20,000 people, pulling from the NHANES cohort. They assessed eating habits via two 24-hour dietary recalls. Dietary recalls are subject to recall bias, so this is not a super strong type of data. That's sort of one limitation of this study, clearly. And the other, and I think this is the biggest flaw in this data set, is based upon these two days of survey recall about their diet. They then tracked people for the next eight years and drew conclusions from that. And so, of course, obviously, a lot can change over that next eight years. So, again, in my mind, these are the two, and these are fairly substantial, limitations questioning the quality of the data and therefore the reliability. They did a number of things right in this study. They controlled for confounders. Confounders are essentially noise in the signal. As one example, if we observed that people who use tanning beds had a shorter life expectancy, it might be because people who use tanning beds also drink and smoke. And so it may not be the tanning beds in and of themselves that are causing the disease and the death, it might be the other unhealthy behaviors that accompany tanning bed use. So this study, the, this data set, did control for a number of important confounders, age, sex, race, education, income, and what's known as food security status. Very importantly, they controlled for diet quality, caloric intake. They also control for BMI. This is your height to weight ratio. And I'll underscore that and come back to a distinction between BMI, height to weight, as compared to body composition in a moment. But continuing with what they confounded or what they controlled for regarding confounders, smoking, drinking, leisure physical activity. So not exercise per se, but how active people were outside of structured exercise. And also if people had any sort of self-reported health condition. And here, I do think, again, the researchers did a good job of controlling for many important confounders. Now, that being said, there were a few confounders that they did not control for. Stress, poor sleep, and irregular work schedules. Taken collectively, I do think as far as it goes to confounders, 
I think they controlled for most important confounding variables. But coming back to this component of body mass index or your, your height to weight ratio, as it compares to body composition, because the one flaw in BMI is it doesn't tell you about body composition. So someone could be heavier because they have a fair amount of muscle mass. Someone could be lighter, but have a very low level of muscle mass. And that's actually what was found in this cohort. The cohort that fasted actually had lower muscle mass. Quoting the researchers, we did observe that people who restricted eating to a period less than eight hours per day, that's the TRE, time-restricted eating, had less lean muscle mass compared with those with a typical eating duration of 12 to 16 hours. So this is definitely important. Lower muscle mass does correlate with cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. There is one other point here that I feel to be important, and that is these subjects weren't necessarily fasting on purpose. So what if we look at a randomized control trial that had people fast with intention? A 2022 RCT had people eat over a eight hour window and people broke down into two groups. They either had that eating window early in the day or late in the day. And the researchers called this early TRE or late TRE. Essentially, people either stopped eating by 3 p.m. pretty early or 8 p.m. a little bit late. Very interestingly, there was no improvement in the markers measured in the late TRE group, even though they reduced calories, really indicating that an earlier fasting window is likely what we want to be focusing on. And this sort of foreshadows the change that I'll be making. They found that the early TRE group had greater improvements in insulin resistance, fasting glucose, body fat mass, so not muscle mass, fat mass, inflammation, and they had a healthier or a enriched gut microbiota diversity. Now, another thing that we can do to really take stock of if this poster presentation is something that we should take seriously and something that we should use to change and inform how we fast would be comparing that to what the body of evidence globally regarding fasting shows us. And this is where a meta-analysis that summarizes the existing literature can be quite helpful. And thankfully, just this year, 2024, a meta-analysis of 13 randomized control trials was published. There's a few findings within this study, so let's just talk through them because there's a lot that we can learn from these. Looking at any type, any window of time-restricted eating versus regular eating, they found that the time restriction led to no loss in muscle mass, improved weight loss by about four pounds, decreased inflammation as TNF-alpha, an inflammatory cytokine, decreased fasting glucose, five points, improved insulin resistance, and improved blood pressure. Now, coming back to this comparison of early versus late time-restricted eating, in those consolidating to an earlier eating window, there was superior weight loss, fasting blood glucose, fasting insulin, and insulin resistance. So again, why this is so novel is that we're looking at the results across 13 randomized control trials on fasting, clearly demonstrating that it does matter when you fast. It's, I think, incorrect based upon these data to say, well, I'm just going to eat later in the day, compress my window, and that's going to be okay. If you're eating too late, that seems to be inferior. And specifically, how this study defined early versus late, early was defined as starting the eating before 10 and the last meal at or before 6 p.m. And then late TRE started at or after noon, and their last meal was after 6 p.m. Now, this also begs the question, does it matter when you start or when you have your last meal? My interpretation is it's more important the time you have your last meal because you could do a four-hour eating window where maybe you started at two 
and, or six hour window might be the most practical. You start at noon and you end at six. My thinking is when you have your last meal is probably the most important factor. And this may be because the time you go to bed and the proximity of eating to bedtime are what's going to most tightly track with when you have your last meal. Quoting these researchers, early TRE, time-restricted eating, especially the 16 to eight strategy, offers multiple benefits. It can simultaneously preserve fat-free mass while promoting weight loss, reduce abdominal obesity and inflammation, and improve glucose metabolism. These results highlight that early TRE could serve as a safe and sustainable long-term solution for the prevention of sarcopenic obesity, that's low muscle mass and high fat mass, and cardiovascular disease. The most important thing I've taken away from this is it's not just if you fast, but it's the window of fasting, and most importantly, when you have your last meal, which should be at or before 6 p.m. So then in conclusion, be cautious of the alarming headlines from this observational poster presentation. I do not feel the data are of sufficient quality to inform change. If we do look at the high quality meta-analysis data, time-restricted eating improves cardiovascular and metabolic markers and overall health. Early TRE seems to be better than late TRE with a eight hour or perhaps less eating window starting earlier in the day and making sure you have your last meal at or before 6 p.m. And I hope what this helps you to do is look at not only what you're eating, but when you're eating and realize that despite, again, what this poster found, it has limitations that I feel are insufficient to supplant what that meta-analysis of 13 randomized control trials tells us, which is fasting is good for you, especially when you use a earlier fasting or, or, or feeding window and don't eat too late in the day. Alrighty, this is Dr. Ruscio. Hope this helps and I'll talk to you next time.